Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our Jamestown unit looking at the first two to three decades of the Jamestown colony. And today's episode starts in September of 1607. If you want to find out what happened prior to that, I suggest you go back and listen or watch last week's episode. Today we start on September 10th, 1607, when John Ratcliffe becomes the second governor of Virginia after Edward Wingfield is essentially deposed and accused of starving the colonists. Despite this change in leadership, the deaths continue into the next week, as noted by George Percy, one of three people were following in the writings. Fortunately, aid would come from an unlikely source, as Captain Smith would write. Let's have a look. But now was all our provisions spent, the sturgeon gone, all helps abandoned, each hour expecting the fury of the savages, when God, the patron of all good endeavors, in that desperate extreme so changed the hearts of the savages that they brought such plenty of their fruits and provision as no man wanted. So the natives there lend a hand to the Jamestown colonists, and it does slow the death rate down, but, you know, despite this new lease on life, it's estimated at this point that only 46 of the original 104 colonists are still alive. Captain Smith, while he was kind of a part of the leadership change and did not think highly of Wingfield, also didn't have great things to say about Ratcliffe. Let's have a look. The new president, Ann Martin, being little beloved, of weak judgment in dangers and less industry and peace, committed the managing of all things abroad to Captain Smith, who by his own example, good words, and fair promises, set some to mow, others to bind thatch, some to build houses. So Smith is named essentially Cape Merchant, is the title, and is given some responsibility and, you know, of course, instead of um, saying that he was delegated, he says that the, the president and a member of the council have weak judgment and are little loved. So, uh, you know, Smith is not uh, a unifying political force here in Jamestown. In November of 1607, George Kendall, who was mentioned by Wingfield as the, uh, the colonial prisoner, is executed. So Jamestown executes one of their own. Wingfield, who is still writing, and it's believed he is, I don't want to say he's kept prisoner, but he's under what seems to be like house arrest, informs Governor Ratcliffe that he would like to go back to England. Probably not a bad idea. As November turns to December, there's no new supply ship. Remember, uh, it was hoped that Newport would be back by November. We're now in December. No new supply ship. So John Smith goes on an expedition into Virginia's interior. Now, this is where the story gets kind of interesting and... Uh, Events occur that I think get romanticized slightly in the world which we live in today. Smith's party going into the interior of Virginia is actually ambushed and slain, Captain Smith being the only survivor, and he is taken prisoner by the Powhatan Confederacy. While in custody, Smith claims he was about to be killed when the Powhatan chief's daughter, a girl by the name of Pocahontas, throws herself on him to save his life. A couple of days later, Smith is brought to a hut where Chief Powhatan tells him 
that they are now friends and decides to release him. At the same time, Wingfield, the same time this is going on, Wingfield in his writing is complaining that the council is only comprised of Ratcliffe and a man named Martin, who John Smith had mentioned. So with Smith gone, the council only had two active members. When John Smith returns to the colony on January 2nd, January 2nd, 1608, he is accused of being responsible for the deaths of his party when he was captured. And this, to some extent, is detailed in Wingfield's writings. Mr. Martin, who was on the council, felt that the slaughter was the fault of Captain Smith, sought to have him convicted of crimes and place him in captivity. According to Wingfield, and the reason I say this is because I couldn't necessarily find it anywhere else, there was a trial a conviction, and a hanging scheduled the day after the trial. Now, clearly that didn't happen, but to think that now Captain Smith, back in jail again, ready to be executed, after somebody had already been executed, so I mean, the fact that they were going to follow through was probably evident. What would cause that to change? Well, thanks to Mr. Wingfield, we know. Let's have a look at his writing. But it pleased God to send Captain Newport onto us the same evening to an unspeakable comfort whose arrival saved Mr. Smith's life and mine because he took me out of the ship and gave me leave to lie in the town. Also by his coming was prevented a parliament which a new counselor, Mr. Recorder, intended to summon. Thus error begot error. The important part there, and again, I think I talked about this earlier, Wing, Wingfield's writing is nothing to, uh, to admire. It's tough to get through. But the important part there is Wingfield feels like Smith was a day away from being executed and he was likely going to die as well. Newport comes back. He's there with his first supply. He's there with a hundred new settlers. And you can imagine his, uh, his shock to show up and there being approximately 40 people left alive. You know, he left with a hundred and now there's 40. They've executed George Kendall. So I'm sure Newport's hearing of that. And they're about to execute John Smith. It really sounds like Jamestown has become more like the Lord of the Flies. And Newport coming back and bringing supplies brings some stability. While hopes rise with the first supply, they don't last long. John Smith will tell you why. Let's have a look. And so we returned all well to Jamestown where this new supply being lodged with the rest accidentally fired their quarters and so the town, which being but thatched with reeds, the fire was so fierce as it burnt their palisades. With their arms, bedding, apparel, and much private provision. Good Master Hunt, our preacher, lost all his library and all he had but the clothes on his back. Yet, no one ever heard him repine at his loss. So a fire devastates Jamestown, devastates the fort. Many people lose everything. And to make matters worse, we're in January of 1608, a cold winter is about to come down on an undersupplied colony. Let's go back to Smith's writing. Now, for all this plenty, our ordinary was but meal and water, so that this great charge little relieved our wants, whereby with the extreme of the bitter cold frost and those defects, 
more than half of us died. I cannot deny, but both Smith and Scrivener did their best to amend what was amiss, but with the president went the major part that their horns were too short. So a little bit of a, a nudge at the president there. Uh, Scrivener is a man named Matthew Scrivener who steps up to become a member of the council. In fact, a young man, age 28 at that time. But uh, Smith wasn't much older either. And uh, so Scrivener and Smith tend to form a dynamic duo, if you will. And, and Smith, as I said, boastful individual. Historians sometimes doubt some of the ho heroic things he claims he did. But, but to Smith's credit, that winner, he did team up and do something with uh, Captain Newport. And this is pointed out by Wingfield. Let's look at the writing. This vigilant captain, slacking no opportunity that might advance the prosperity of the colony, having settled the company upon the former works, took Mr. Smith and Mr. Scrivener, who was another counselor of Virginia, went to discover a river on the further side whereof the dwelling of the great Poetan, and to trade with him for corn. So Newport, Scrivener, Smith, they go, they trade for corn. That helps the colony get through the rest of the winter. And on April 20th, 1608, another ship arrives, Captain Francis Nelson, aboard the ship Phoenix with 40 more new settlers, which is probably fewer than the number that died over the winter. Captain Nelson, and probably much to his surprise, arrives finding Jamestown in the process of being rebuilt. During the spring, seven natives are captured trying to raid the town. Smith negotiates their release with Pocahontas, the daughter of Chief Powhatan, and again, that is noted from Smith's writings. Let's have a look. After Smith had given the prisoners what correction he thought fit, used them well a day or two after, and then delivered them Pocahontas, for whose sake one he feigned to save their lives and give them liberty. The patient counsel that nothing would move to war with the savages would greatly have wrangled with Captain Smith for his cruelty, yet none was slain to any man's knowledge, but it brought them in such fear and obedience as his very name would sufficiently affright them. So Smith is trying to cover over the tensions between uh, the colonists and the Powhatan. Smith reveals in his writings that the colonists did sell swords to the natives, a move which he calls, uh, Smith calls, quote, the president's weakness. In May, Captain Newport takes his ships back to England, and with him, Edward Maria Wingfield, the first and now disgraced uh, governor of the colony. Wingfield would return to England and have to defend charges of being an atheist and having Spanish sympathies. These charges uh, seem to have gone away, so he must have defended them rather easily. Wingfield, despite this experience, would remain active with the Virginia Company, but he would be more obscurely present he would die in 1631, never having returned to Jamestown. With Wingfield gone, things begin to deteriorate with Governor John Ratcliffe. Let's have a look. The prodigality of the president's state went so deep into our small store that Smith and Scrivener tied him and his parasites to the rules of proportion. But now Smith being to depart, the
the president's authority so oversuade the discretion of Master Scrivener that our store, our time, our strength, and labors were idly consumed to fulfill his fantasies. And something that Smith is referring to, I believe there, is Ratcliffe's desire to have a governor's home built. And I think what Smith is saying is that resources are being squandered, uh, that Ratcliffe needed to think about the proportion of what is going on there. And when Smith said leave, in June and July of 1608, Smith and a group of men leave to explore the Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac River, and they're in search of a waterway westward. 116 years after Columbus, and they're still looking for a waterway west. On July 22nd, John Ratcliffe resigned as the governor of the colony. In his place was named Matthew Scrivener. So Matthew Scrivener becomes the third governor of Jamestown slash Virginia. Smith continues his regional exploration and befriends another native group and in befriending this group, the Rappahannocks, that tribe would go so far as to promise to plant food for the colony. Now as I said before, Scrivener was a young man, he was 28, and it appears as if his governorship was temporary because upon Smith's return, Captain John Smith is elected governor of the colony on September 10, 1608. He becomes the colony's fourth governor. So I think Scrivener was there to fulfill the one-year term. And now Captain Smith is governor of Virginia. On September 29th, Captain Newport returns with a second supply ship and 70 more new colonists. Now at this point, we are for 1609, very dependent upon Smith's writings, 1608-1609. And in that fall, Smith essentially is working to trade with natives for corn, but he finds them unwilling. In December of 1608, Captain Newport leaves and takes John Ratcliffe with him. Unlike Wingfield, Ratcliffe would ultimately return. With Newport, going back to England, Smith sends a letter back to the Virginia Company and the representatives in England. The letter is considered rude and the first paragraph says all you need to know about it. Let's have a look. Received your letter wherein you write that our minds are so set upon faction and idle conceits in dividing the country without your consents and that we feed you but with ifs and ands, hopes and some few proofs, as if we would keep the mystery of the business to ourselves, and that we must expressly follow your instructions sent by Captain Newport, the charge of whose voyage amounts to near 2,000 pounds, the which if we cannot defray by the ship's return, we are likely to remain as banished men. To these particulars, I humbly entreat your pardons if I offend you with my rude answer. Essentially, there's some disconnect between what's going on in England and what's going on in the colonies, and that's what Smith is pointing out. England is seeing the factions unfold. They're, they probably heard from Wingfield. He's an investor who's returned as a disgraced governor, and they're concerned. And this, I think we can report in 1608 is the first tension between the colonists and England. Smith isn't having it. Now, further tragedy would hit the colony. On January 7, 1609, Matthew Scrivener and eight other settlers drowned during a storm. At the same time, natives 
and the relationship with the natives was horribly deteriorating. In fact, Scrivener's death isn't even really mentioned much by, by Smith. On January 16th, Smith and his expedition barely escape an ambush. While all this is going on, you've got all these issues, rude letter heading back, uh, death, starvation, fires, yada, yada, yada. The Jamestown movement in England, what people know about Jamestown and what's going on, is growing. And King James expands the powers of the Virginia Company by issuing the second charter of Virginia on May 23rd, 1609. The charter names 650 people who have invested in colonizing Virginia and would have influence on the company's policies. Well, I'm sure that's not the response Smith would have wanted. On June 2nd, a nine-ship fleet with more than 600 new settlers leaves for Jamestown. John Ratcliffe, the former governor, was commanding one of the ships. Six of these ships would reach Jamestown in August with over 300 new settlers. Smith writes that the new arrivals were heavily against him from the moment they set foot on the ground. And, you know, why not? John Ratcliffe was among the leadership of this group coming back. I'm sure he did not have glowing things to say about Smith. And Smith really... I think just focused on trying to have relations with the natives, which didn't work out, trying to secure food supplies, trying to keep people working. And uh, really, he doesn't go into a ton of detail about his governorship as far as I'm concerned. A lot of traveling, a lot of relational attempts, and a lot of rubbing people the wrong way. In September of 1609, as he's coming up on his one-year uh, anniversary as colonial governor in the end of the one-year term, John Smith is severely injured when a gunpowder bag explodes on him. He is removed from the governor's post and replaced by George Percy. We remember George Percy, the fifth governor of the colony. Percy is immediately overwhelmed by the size of the colony and decides to split his efforts into three parts. Percy restores uh, some responsibility for John Ratcliffe and asks that he become in charge of building new forts to help secure the area. On October 4, 1609, Captain Smith would leave for England to heal from his wounds and he would never return to Jamestown. Captain Smith and that gunpowder incident too kind of set off some speculation as to whether or not that was an accident or intentional. While many believe Smith was the sole source of problems in the Jamestown colony, his exit did not stop those challenges from coming. There were new challenges, different challenges, continued problems besetting the Jamestown colony. And we'll talk about those next week on Historical Context. <laughs>